right, welcome to today's webinar. Today I've got a, a, a super nice guy, Ian Foyer. How are you, Ian? I'm doing great, man, considering, uh, you know, being locked in the house for the past, what seems like five years, but yeah, doing good, doing good. Yes, it does seem that for sure. So, so Ian is joining us from California. Um, he's, got a, he's got a really good journey to talk to us about, and I'm sure for those that are going to be in uh, listening to this and watching this live, there'll be some some great questions to ask, I'm sure, throughout this uh, webinar. So if you look when you join in, you'll see on the right hand side, you have like a, a little control box there to be able to put your questions in. So fire away asking questions you want to, and then um, we will get that presented to Ian as we go along. So Ian, without further ado, why don't you give us a quick just intro about uh, where you come from, where you where you where the journey of soccer has taken you, and then we'll just elaborate upon that when we come back. Sure. I mean, uh, born in Vegas, Las Vegas, and at the uh, age of 16, I started playing soccer when I was eight years old. Age uh, 16, I decided to uh, try my luck overseas. And uh, through a previous tournament that I played in Europe with my club team from Las Vegas, we stayed at a uh, host family. So when I was 16, I, I decided, I called up the host family to see if I could stay with them for a while while I tried out for some teams. And they said yes, um, and I went and literally knocked on some doors, and the second door I knocked on was uh, FC Bruges, one of the biggest teams in Belgium, and uh, after an hour of looking at me, they signed me to a youth, a youth contract of the 16 and under team, and uh, from that, a year later, I signed pro at uh, age 17. Um, from there, from Belgium, I, was, I spent five years with FC Bruges and uh, RWD Molenbeek, another team in the top division. And then moved to West Ham United of the Premier League in uh, 1993 94. Um, was there for about two seasons. And uh, then I went on, uh, uh, got transferred. I got sold to Luton Town and I played most of my games for Luton Town, uh, which at that time was in the English Championship. Um, had a little spell with uh, New England Revolution and Colorado Rapids in the MLS. And then I went back to West Ham in uh, 2000. I think it was 99 to 2000 or something like that. Um, retired in 2005 and then started my own goalkeeping academy, um, as well as uh, having coached for the full national team, men and women and Olympics and um, coaching goalkeepers all around the country. Yeah. So that's a, that's a very that's short. Quite a gap there. And of course, we'll, we'll, we'll also talk a little bit about LA Galaxy later as well, if you don't mind. So, well, let's, let's start from the beginning because I think your journey, um, what's been, what's been echoing through the themes of the webinars we've been doing before is just those opportunities to break into the soccer world. It's not an easy world to break into. Um, and very, very few people, you've been so lucky to break into that world. Um, very, very few people do do that. So um, growing up, um, a little bit off of the topic, just with your parents, they were very much in the entertainment business and, and prominent in the entertainment business uh, in Vegas. So how did you, did you enjoy life in Vegas, your upbringing in Vegas? Was it, um, was it a lot, with your parents being in the entertainment business, was it very unusual for you with schooling and everything else? It was different, yeah, because um, my father's a famous musician, my mom was a famous uh, showgirl in, in Las Vegas as well, and um, you know, I'm growing up and, and my dad played for Elvis, Diana Ross, Paul Anka, Frank Sinatra, um, pretty much anyone that went through Vegas, he, he, he did. So, you know, I, I kind of grew up with that and little did I know at the time how big these people were because I was so young, um, you know, and I had like barbecues at Diana Ross's Lake Tahoe house and I, I had no clue who she was. I mean, I knew who she was obviously, but I mean, she's kind of a big deal. Um, so yeah, I mean, growing up there was different. It, it was a different Vegas. I mean, back then it was very uh, mafia orientated, which, you know, $2 buffet, they, they didn't make their money off, off, you know, $5 bottles of water. Now it's kind of like a Disneyland where everything's like $75 and it's expensive and it's very touristy. So growing up there was fun, but it was, it was kind of boring because if you don't gamble back then, it was, there was nothing really to do. Yeah. And, and you played obviously, uh, your youth soccer there. What was the youth soccer um, environment and the outlook there at, at uh, the time when you was a kid? Oh man, it, it was. I mean, I look at how 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 far we've come in this country. Uh, for me, I played on a great team. It was called the Las Vegas Generals. We had a great coach, great group of kids that just stuck together. We we had the same team for about four or five years. It wasn't like where you had all these different teams and people are poaching and taking players. You just had a team and you built it. So it was a great a great experience and it brought me to you know 
the level that I needed to be to, to try out over in Europe. And, and it wasn't as much, uh, you know, technical, but it was just, you know, we just got on the field and we just gave it everything we had every time. And I think mentally uh, we were a lot stronger than the players of today. Back then, I think we just, you know, we were mentally stronger. And now they're maybe technical, more technical now, but back then the mental side was definitely something that we all, we all had. And uh, it, it was, a, it was, it was a good, it was a good experience, but again, it's, you can't even compare it skill wise to what we have today in the youth, in the youth setups. Oh, absolutely. Now you were saying about what it brought you up to that level. Do you, how far away did you have to travel being in Vegas? Was you in Southern California, Northern California? Did you have to, could you get enough of the competition level that you needed in, in Vegas or did you, was it pretty much a lot of travel at that young age? We didn't have, we didn't travel that much. It wasn't as, 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 uh, I can't remember how much we paid, but it was more local stuff. We would do a tournament or two a year. I mean, I remember going to Arizona one time and I think down to San Diego one time for a surf tournament. But um, in general, it was pretty local. You know, it was such a, at the beginning stages, you know, of, of being a club environment. So um, it was pretty basic, yeah. So what do you think helped you to, to rise to that level that you we're not going to go to Europe yet. We're not going to talk about that yet. But uh, how, do, how do you think that helped you? Was it coaching? Was it the type of coaches? Was it just the competition level that was there? Or the fact that you were seven, you know, 365 days a year playing it? Yeah, my, my coach for my team, back, you know, invented this ball machine. It was one of the first ball machines that shot a soccer ball. And, you know, he would just take me out to the park and just blast this thing on me as hard as he could and just keep going up and up and up with the speed. And I just couldn't get enough of it. And I think that's where a lot of my foundations came from. And it wasn't like he was telling me how to catch it. It was just keep doing it and you're going to figure it out what's the best way. And, and, you know, so I got to credit a lot to my coach, Larry Griffith, that spent that time with me um, on weekends. And, you know, I'd be in Vegas and it'd be like it didn't matter. It was 95, 105 degrees. And I was out there like I remember bringing lunch to the park. It would be like a couple hours, have some lunch, do another couple hours and I literally couldn't get enough. So that built my kind of mental strength to not give up. And uh, so when, like I said, when I went to Europe, um, that was one of the, that's the thing that kind of separates, I think, with making it a knot. There's a lot of good and great players, but if you don't have the mental toughness, it, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. So I credit a lot to that. Well, I think there's a lot to be said about that, leaving your home and what you know and leaving at 16. Um, so just a quick thing before we go to, to that 16 years and leaving, I know that we're not going to talk too much about this, the, the year out you had from soccer, but what did that year out of soccer really do for you? It was a forced, it was a forced um, um, break for you. What, what, what did you do? Because I think what we can relate to, uh, it's a longer question, I apologize Ian, but what we can relate to now in the lockdown with kids is something that I feel has been lost, a lost art form, which is individual training. And, and just working from home and just going to the backyard. I feel that too many kids in this day and age are always looking to somebody to tell them what to do or wh where to go or give them instructions. What did you, let's, let's have a little bit of what you could do when you were forced really in that period of your life to, mm -hmm. to not be involved in, in organized soccer. Yeah, again, it's just getting creative. And if you really want something, you're gonna find ways. I went to, I mean, I can do, I could do a year's worth of training against the wall and, and, and cause I've just done it. and. You know, I went against the wall and I kicked it and I was like, oh, wow, okay. And then it moves over here and I was like, oh, I can do this and I can try this and I can do my hands. I can go on my side. I can do that. So like you said, everybody um, is waiting for someone to tell them what to do. But, you know, if you really want it, you get out there and you and you just do it. And uh, so, yeah, I did a lot of stuff against the wall. Um, and again, my coach was with me that I spoke earlier about Larry Griffith um, during that time. So he he kept going with me. And he knew I'd get through it. And it also just gave me a little bit of a, you know, a little bit, bit of a bite to, to, to kind of prove a little bit of a couple people wrong. And, uh, you know, because I had some political stuff that happened to me. And uh, so it was, it was fulfilling when, it, when I did eventually sign pro. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a big part of some of the separations. Even when I was working in the UK, I was at Argyle, so we used to play against Luton a few times. Um, um, that's an intimidating place, man. Yeah. <laughs> down the that's south, it was heathens. But, um, but I think it, it also there's always something that I know from some of the kids that separates them. And you're right, it's not always the best kid 
that's going to make it. It's the person that can deal with the, the psychological aspect, you know, playing in front of a lot of people, making sure they live their lifestyle right. So I think that that resonates to a lot of our players. And I, and I hope those players that are listening can, can hear that from you. Um, just that get up starter. So, so we're moving on from that year break. You've done a little bit more in the, obviously in the youth ranks in the United States. And at some point in your mind, there must have been something that triggered you to say, man, I, need to, I want to play pro. I, I want to be able to have an opportunity to play at the, the highest level I can possibly play. When was that? How did that come about? What, what triggered your mind at that point to say, I'm leaving everything behind at 16 years old. I'm, I'm heading to Europe. Yeah. So, I mean, at age, I think it was uh, nine or 10. I just, oh, that's all I wanted to do in my mind. What solidified it was um, when I was 15, barely 16, um, I went to a goalkeeping camp with uh, a famous goalkeeper named Tony Schumacher. So us oldens will remember him, obviously, and then the young, and so I, they won't know. But he was he was at that time one of the best keepers in the world, um, very famous for good and bad reasons. Uh, he's, he, you know, but in my mind, he was, he was one of the best in the world. And And to be honest, at that time in Vegas, when I was growing up, we only had uh, one game a week, and it was called Soccer Made in Germany. So I did. I wasn't even exposed to some of the other greats, you know, the Neville Southalls yet, and 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 the, you know all these other guys, some of the guys in England and rest of the world. So all I had was these German keepers, and every week it'd be you know Bayern Munich versus FC Köln, and you know. So you know I got a lot. I got to see him a lot. So he became one of my favorite keepers, and I was just reading Soccer America one time, and it was like Tony Schumacher's doing a camp in Alabama. And, uh, you know, the first 30 kids, you know, get get in, whatever. So I sign up for that. I do the, 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 the camp. I meet my idol. And around three to four days into this week-long camp, um, Tony Schumacher himself calls me over and he says, hey, you know, come over here. And he pulls me aside and he's like, uh, what are your plans? I go, what do you mean? And he goes, well, with soccer. I go, I just want to become a pro. He goes, look, you're good enough, but you got to go now. And I was just 16 at that time, I think. So here's my idol telling me I can do it. And I think that's what just tipped me over to to really just really going for it. And um, I called my mom from Alabama. I said, you know, Tony said, you know, I'm good enough. He thinks I should go over now. And my mom just said, all right, let's start making some plans. You know, so that's when I called that uh, host family that I stayed with during my time when uh, I went to Belgium with my my team. And that's when it all kind of rolled into me heading over there. So when you got to Europe, how did you how did you find the cultural differences from what you're used to as a young 16 year old? And, you know, we left school. I left school at 16 as well. It's, so I think our, our time period to, to nowadays could be a lot different than what the kids are used to. But um, going to a completely different country, a host family playing for a different language. I know they can speak some English there, but of course, there's different languages in Belgium. Um, how did how did the culture affect you? How did you uh, how did you adjust to that culture? It was again, if I didn't have the mental strength, it would have broke a lot of people. Put it that way. I mean, I go over at 16, and at that time, I was the first American goalkeeper over there. Um, and when I signed pro, I was the first American keeper to sign pro. So I'm here, and I'm I'm training with uh, at 17 with the the first team of FC Bruges and I got I mean there's like seven national team players Jan Kulemans, Frankie van der Els, Mark de Greza, you know all these famous famous players and I'm getting shelled you know I'm 17 I can you know I'm 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 trying to just stay above water you know and 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 I'm um they're looking at me kind of like in the beginning you know go home and play basketball what this is our sport you know so there was a lot of that I had to get through. On top of that, it's a foreign language. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, it's just you had to not just be as good as someone else from the same country. There, You have to be better. And there's, there was a lot of prejudice at the time. And I kind of just had to get my head down and, and, and just keep going. I mean, I, have, I had a player one time after uh, we, we did a small-sided game. And like I said, it's my 10th day of training with the first team as a pro. And I'm 17, barely 17. And one of the we, we had a small sided game and then the, the coach says next goal wins. So everybody's, you know, wants to win. I let a goal in that I should have maybe saved. Um, and I remember the, the one of the senior players about we were walking back to the locker room and he pulls me aside. He literally grabbed my arm and he pulls me aside and he goes, you know, a couple of explicit words in there as well, but he goes, What are you doing here? And I go, What do you mean? He goes, He goes, You're useless. He goes, Why don't you just fly back home? 
on the first flight, he goes, Americans don't play soccer. And I just sat there and I was like, this is, I couldn't answer back. You know, there's a very hierarchy system at that time. And, you know, I just had to take it, you know? So I went around the corner, you know, like I was going, and I just started balling, man, you know? And it was tough, you know, I mean, I'm away from home, foreign language, um, which I, I speak fluent, you know, I, I spoke fluent, I speak fluent Dutch after like six months there because I committed to, to trying to um, adapt as much as I could to their culture. Um, but yeah, it was tough. And then you got to go out and, you know, play with that same person, knowing, you know, with all that pressure and, you know, so it would have, it would have probably broke a lot of people, but for me, it inspired me and, you know, I just take those moments to, to become stronger and better. Can, can you really attest to it's symptoms like that? You know, the, the year out, the, the um, confrontation with the player that have really been key moments in your career that have helped you spread along and, and maintain that path. Because obviously it, it, it worked out in the end for sure, because you end up playing for the, for the U S national team. And we'll talk about that in just a second. And of course, well, what's, in the, in the premiership. What's, what's interesting about that story is the player that told me that his dream was to play in the premiership, the EPL. So fast forward to four years later, I signed pro with West Ham United in the EPL, okay? Um, and I visited uh, Bruges about, I don't know, six months after I signed for West Ham. And I'm just, I'm doing a little bit of shopping, you know, just walking around and I walk in and I see that same player. But the difference is he's actually working there now. So, yeah, so I walk up, he's got his name tag on and everything. And I'm like, hey, what's up, buddy? I won't mention his name, but I go, hey, what's up, buddy? He's like, Ian, hey, what's up? He's trying, you know, he's like, you know, what's up with you? What's, you know, I go, you know what, man? I, and I'm, I normally am not like this. I'm very humble usually. But this time I just, I, sp- I put it on thick. I was like, you know, man, just living the dream. You know, my biggest goal in life was to play in the English Premier League. I just signed for West Ham United, became the first American goalkeeper to sign in the Premier League. Um, just, I, I couldn't be more happy. I go, this is an absolute dream. And then I go, so what are you up to these days? And he's got a name tag, so it's obvious. Right. And it was just such, oh, I'm not a revengeful person, but it felt good. Put it that way. It felt good. Yeah. Well, you know, what goes around comes around in most respects, right? So exactly. it's good for you. So how, so how did it feel? I mean, West Ham and that area of London, that is some diehard fans up there. Um, so yeah. how did you adjust to that, to that West Ham? And where did you live? What, what part of London did you live? I lived in uh, Waltham Abbey. Okay. Or Waltham Abbey, as they say. You know? Yeah. Um, you know what? It suited me very well because I'm very, very passionate. Um, I wear my heart on my sleeve when I play. I interact with the, the supporters. Um, I, like if you, gave, if you give me stick, I love it. it, it I just, you know, like um, my first year I played, um, all the – the grounds that I would run out to that we are not playing at home, obviously we I'd run out to who the blank you, are you, you know, who the hell are you? So um, the whole stadium be, would be saying, who do you think you are? Basically um, the following season, after I played a few games, I came out to everybody shouting Yankee C word. So it was, I was like, yes, I made it. When they finally, they knew I was a Yank, you know, I was like, yes, I made it. So, and you know, it was fun. So, uh, you know, West Ham, um, uh, as well as Luton, the, the fans are just very, very passionate. If you give 100 percent, they love you. They don't care what happened, but you give 100 percent. So I was very passionate when I played. And I think that that sat well with with the, 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 the teams that I played for. Absolutely. Now, for those that, that are listening in that don't know much about or a bit younger um, listening, the West Ham original ground where it went in, signed with them was a much more intimidating place than where they play now. Um, very intimidating. And, and the type of fan there was was diehard. My, 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 just a little bit about my dad now lives in Essex. Um, so a lot of where he's at with Clacton is a lot, a lot of West Ham fans. That'd be the first place you're going to go to if you're going to support someone. So West Ham in their eyes, they're either West Ham or Tottenham. So it's that kind oh, of kind of background. Here, Romford, all that, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so obviously, so when you were at uh, West Ham back then, it was still called the Premiership. It wasn't changed over to the Premier League just yet. But there were some big players, a bit of influx as well coming in from Europe. But in reality, the American goalkeeper has proven to be a really big hit in the, in the English Premier League. I think 
out of any nationality, with the exception of, of, of the United Kingdom, right, that there's going to be some some players there. Yeah. There's been a, a slew of Americans that have come through the Premier League, you know, and you were that pioneer, really, of, of bringing the American goalkeeper to the Premier League. So how did you feel being in the Premier League um, and, and, and involved in the Premier League and the game days and, the you know, the, the build-ups? And was it everything you thought it was going to be? Oh, um, it was... Even more. I mean, I still remember. And so my I had two spells at West Ham. My first spell, I was behind uh, Ludo McClosco, just legendary goalkeeper. You, he was invincible. The guy was amazing. One of the best keepers they've had. But so I sat at the bench almost every game. I played cup games. I played, uh, you know, friendlies, whatever. But, you know, I was, I was mostly on the bench. But I still remember just going to places like Anfield, you know, uh, walking out. And you're hearing, you know, you never walk alone. And it's just the vibe. I mean, it literally gives you goosebumps, you know. And it, just to say I've 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 done that is like the biggest honor I could ever dream of. And to be part of that whole process and, you know, being over there early and then seeing a lot of guys coming over later and, you know, just being a kind of a pioneer in that aspect. Um, it, it was it was dream come true. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And I know when you did your second spell, it's quite kind of for you. It kind of ran in a circle. Start at West Ham, done some loan um, down at the Posh. That that's a there's a place you went at the Posh for a few games as well. Yeah, How did yeah. you enjoy your time at the Posh? It was great. It was I fun. I, I went there. Yeah, Peterborough. Yeah, I went there um, for three months, and because what happened, I got injured. I was I was I was with West Ham. I got injured, and Redknapp, Harry Redknapp, asked me. He goes, "Hey, I want to get you some games." Peterborough's looking. And so I went to Peterborough, and um, they were in the championship at that time. Um, wait, I think, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I went there for three months and actually got voted as player of the year. But they didn't give it to me, obvious reasons. I wasn't actually signed, but I actually kind of had a really good spell there. Um, so I have, I have a lot of fun memories of, of, of Peterborough. That was a fun time. Now, now tell us who the, the, the manager was at that period of time. That was uh, John Still. So how did uh, how did he how did you rapport with him? How what was your relationship oh, with him? He, him and I got along amazing. He was great, um, great manager, and he he did amazing for me, and and you know just gave me the confidence to play. And like I said, it was my first experience with playing, and then I went back to West Ham and you know joined them again. But he was great. Now now, I'm trying to make sure my mind's right. Peterborough first, then Luton, or was it Luton then Peterborough? No, it was Peterborough oh, first. Okay, yeah. then Luton. Then Luton bought you for about half a mil, right? Yeah, it was, I think yeah, it's close to about six hundred thousand pounds. Yeah. Yeah. So um, your time at Luton, how did how did that go? Did you what what, what was, things can you tell us a little bit about Luton? Well, it, there was just a love affair that grew because I started off on loan there. Um, the same thing happened a year. I was back back to West Ham. I got injured again. I broke my wrist. Redknapp wanted to get me some more games, so I went to Luton, and um, I. Uh, just I started my first game against Millwall, uh, funny enough, against Casey Keller. And at Millwall, uh, at, Millwall at the, the, at the den. Yeah. Oh, talk about the debut, huh? Yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, and especially them knowing I'm a West Ham keeper. I mean, that's the rivalry there. We, we all know about that one. Oh, well, I can only um, imagine. Yeah. So I, I played there and, and, and just I played my first game and just every game, um, this love affair grew with myself and the fans. And um, my intention was to go to Luton for three months and then come back to West Ham and then give Ludo McClosco a really good push. Um, but by the time I finished my three months at, 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 uh, at uh, Luton, um, I, just, I just fell in love with Luton so much and the fans. Um, not that I did with West Ham. I think with Ludo McClosco and goal, it was it was tough to get games, and I, I started getting games, and I started getting the feel of, of of playing, and I wanted to keep playing and all that. Um, so, yeah, I, I just got love for both teams, and, and it's it both were pretty amazing. Yeah, I can imagine. So you've talked a lot about the fan base in the in the Premier League, and and I'm sure a lot of people listening here they may not have had a chance to go to the Premier League; they can only hear it on TV and stuff, but. The, the connection with the fans. What what do you feel was the um, the difference between the American side of Major League Soccer, which you were soon to break into again, as opposed to what the it, right now for the English game, as opposed to Premier League Championship, whatever. What was what was the difference between the fan base and and what it meant to them 
in both the well even, you can even include belgium in this if you want to between belgium america and the united or england in particular you played in england in particular but. i think i think it's just the fanaticism i mean just england it's just it's the be all end all you know um i think american sports in general are entertainment you know for the fans um and i think here uh sorry in england it's just it's it's life and death it's religion it's everything now with that said um you go to some mls grounds and they're fanatical i mean you you see what lafc is doing you see what uh galaxy you know some of the fan bases atlanta i mean they're we got some really good fan bases so it's not to disrespect that but i'm talking at the time you know when i was when i was over there it wasn't the same so but but to this day even it's still just that 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 just bit more and and the build up to the game is different you know um i remember we're playing on a saturday and if you start on monday just that build up from monday to game time was so intense you know and um there's really nothing you can describe i mean and then when you step out and you hear the roar of the crowd and and just everybody getting into it's just it's 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 intense i have I have friends that have, have, have gone to every sporting event in America, including Super Bowls and playoffs and this and that. And they've gone to 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 England. I've gotten them tickets to West Ham, and they call me from the game, and they're just like, "You actually played in this environment." I, they're like, "It's so much more intense than you can even describe." If you have an experience, and what's interesting is it's not even the Premier League. And if you, in fact, if you go to some of the places, the Plymouths, the Lutons, the mm-hmm. you know, the Bristol Cities. Those teams, I mean, it's even worse. It, it is so much more intense, you know. That's so it, that's the beauty of England. There's just every, there's so much tradition and there's so many teams that have a fan base that is so fanatical and you just don't leave your team. You know, you don't switch teams. That's what know? I was about to say. You're born into your team and you're you're intolerant to to other teams around you. Whereas I think yeah. here, come me coming to the opposite way, I think I can sit at a MLS game and I could be sitting next to, I could go to a Dallas game and sit next to a, at a Galaxy guy and there's, there's, we're up, you're having a drink with each other and shouting how that would never happen in the UK. <laughs> never. No, no. I but walked I, into a bar one time on accident and the, it was the wrong bar. It was in, and it's going back to your point where it's Tottenham or West Ham. And my buddy and I, Ian Bishop, walked into a bar and um, it was a Tottenham bar. And we knew right away. There was only five people in there. And all five at the bar looked at us, looked at us like this, and they went, Mm-mm. you know, and they gave it the two finger salute. And uh, we went <laughs> 100 yards further to the next bar, and it was a West Ham bar, and we were welcomed. And yeah, so it, uh, it, it's intense. For those that are listening now that haven't been and, and would like to go, there is um, in most Premier League games and Championship level games, in fact, it could be throughout the pyramid now that if you go to a game and you're the home fan, then you can go into the bars around there. If you're an away fan, you come to the ground, you watch, <laughs> you go home. So yeah. um, that, that that really is, not that it's dangerous in any shape or form this day and age to even go there. You can take your kids and it's a great experience, but the, you know, they're, they're still, you are a fan of that team. So, and sometimes with players transferring between other, because you were in London, I know you went to Cardiff, I think you went to Cardiff as well, but in London, you're around that London area. They're really intolerant to some people moving between the London clubs as well. It's uh, it's a pretty interesting dynamic. Yeah, if I were, yeah, if I were to move to Tottenham, I mean, I just I'd be hated by West Ham in a very bad way. <laughs> did you get an opportunity at Arsenal? I did. I did. Yes. Um, well, West Ham 2003. Fans, they, ain't too, they ain't too happy about Arsenal either. No, no, no. Yeah. So, but I would have taken it. That, that, that's one I would have. I mean, that was the 2003 team with Henri and, and Vieira and all those guys and Arsene Wenger. Wow. So they, they were looking for. There you go, Arsene Wenger, one of the one of the managers that I um, that in, he was a big part of my coaching, um, going into the coaching world. So, <laughs> what what happened there was there. I, I've jumped a little bit ahead, and I'm going to go back, but I want to ask this question now. What was, what what was the, what was the end product there? Because I would have bitten off right hand to work with Arsene Wenger. Yeah. Um, so what happened was I was uh, uh, I was out of contract at the time, looking for a team, and um, the uh, they asked me to come out. They were, they said, "Can you come out for one day? We want to have a look at you. You know, we need a backup for David Seaman. Uh, we want to look at you." So I'm like, "Of course." Yeah, it was a new training ground, is everything. It was it was a great time. So I go out, I train. After training, Arson goes, uh, "Can you come back 
for a few more days? And of course, I'm like, of course, yeah, I can be here as long as you need to. So, uh, you know, one day turned into about two and a half months. And um, I remember I played a reserve game for them. And the following day in one of the newspapers, it was, uh, you know, Arsene Wenger's going to hand uh, Ian Foyer a one-year contract. And then two hours later, something happened, and they signed a guy named, I think, Remy Shaban or something like that. Mm. And uh, that was kind of it. So, um, yeah, it was a great experience um, to train and train with those guys. It was it was insane. It was insane. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that, again, I mean, I'm not I'm not an Arsenal fan by any means. I'm a, I'm unfortunately I'm a Newcastle United fan, but uh, but that would definitely be a manager or a coach. You know, I learned a lot from him. So, um, I learned being a much. goalkeeper. We're going to talk still a little bit about the English Championship and the Premier League. The goalkeeper in most of these um, grounds um, is station. I don't mean stationary as in just standing there, but they are very close to to the crowd and the fans. And we talked about the fan base. Yeah. Can you tell us some interesting uh, banter you've been having with some of those fans? Like Especially I said, the way I, ends, I'd imagine. Yeah, like I said, I wear my heart on my sleeve, so I get into it. And uh, so I'm playing. Uh, those of you who don't know, the Luton Watford rivalry is up there. It's it's heated. I mean, I, I played about six, maybe five or six of them, and every game, I mean, there's there's fans fighting or you know whatever. Again, it's not dangerous, but just it was it was heated. So we're playing at Watford. And um, on the uh, the end where um, it's their big stand and it's where all the, 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 the heavy the heavy supporters go. So they get a penalty kick and a dodgy penalty kick at that. Um, so the referee calls a penalty kick. I save the penalty kick. And um, after the ball goes down the field, I turn to the whole stand and be, me being the cheeky American that I am. Uh, I give it the old, you know, I, I, I'm not hearing you sing anymore. I can't hear you sing anymore. So right then, you know, pound coins are flying. Anything they could grab or throwing at me. And again, we're we're not too far away, as you said. And uh, so I turned to go, you know, watch the game again that I'm playing in. And uh, all of a sudden, a Coke can from about 30 rows up hits about a yard next to me. And it was pouring rain. It was wet. And the Coke can actually goes in the ground probably about two inches. So if it would have hit me, it would have it hurt <laughs> Um, again, me being who I am, I pick it up, I open it, I take a sip and I cheers, you know, I cheers the stand. And it was such a cool thing because it was a combination of hatred, yet thank you for respond, like, like interacting. So back, half of them yeah. were like laughing, half of them were laughing, half of them were pissed and, you know, how dare you, blah, blah, blah. But it was, it, it was a good, it was a funny moment. So, yeah. Well, you know. I think the goalkeeper is a is a is a pedigree into themselves. I mean, um, you know, you sometimes can be forgotten in training, um, and of course, it's a, a different to an actual player. How do you feel? You're telling about your mentality. Was there anybody that you no no names, but there are people you played with that would have issues or, or really struggled with their game when they had crowds on their back, and um, you know, because that's that's a that can be a lot of pressure when you got 20, 30, 40. I mean, let's be honest, you could go some grounds, there's 40, 50,000 people there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you'd be surprised how many players actually have that that nervousness about them. I mean, I, I've played with one of the biggest players in the world in every game that he would throw up just out of nerves. And, and most of it's the pressure we put on ourselves, you know, um, to just be – Perfect. And especially goalkeepers, goalkeepers, you know, we know what happens when we're not perfect. Um, so we have this, you know, self, you know, perfection that we, we, we try to achieve every single day in practice to then get one or two shots during the weekend, one or two crosses, a bunch of kicks, you know, so we have to train and work so hard to get those two or three moments that are game changers and hopefully they're game changers and a positive one. So we have a natural, we put pressure on ourselves. Um, so, you know, as coaches, it's important to understand that. And sometimes you got to, you know, un, undo the pressure on your players, you know, and I think that's what good coaches sometimes, you know, have a really good knack for. But um, I, w I would say, you know, every team I played on, everyone has a version of it and a version of nerves that, you know, sometimes they deal with it internally you know, and they just keep it in and some express it, you know, yelling and screaming or whatever. But I think every player, when they step out, 
has a reputation to protect and you're only as good as your last game, you know, and that's where the pressure really comes in. And, and like you said, you know, some of the grounds you're playing at are smaller, but they're more intense, um, you know, and, and, and some are bigger and it, it's so it's uh, the intensity is an, is something that you definitely have to learn how to deal with as a player. Um, and the yeah. more games you play, the more you get, you get used to it, but it, it never goes away. Well, I guess if you can, in the psychology, most of these clubs have got psychologists there. And if you can turn that into a positive on the field, I guess that's that's going to make you the better one. And you're right. Um, you know, I used to tell the kids, you know, the clubs I worked at, even the clubs I work at here now, you're only as good as your last game. So don't, I mean, you can have a cracking game, but you need to be able to build upon that. So before we move, I want to jump into um, the U.S. national squad. Before I do, before we come back to the States and, and playing, because you played for the national squad when you were um, in England playing. Most uh, a lot of the time in England, and uh, you know, this is going to be something that is going to relate to a lot of our players and young players and some of our elite players that, that come across this. In the goalkeeping world, there's one position, um, and it's tough because I don't think, unless you're playing, you know, there, there was a there was a time when only a lone striker was being played in the modern game, but even now that's gone away. You've got three, you know, two to three strikers with only being one goalkeeper and possibly three keepers in the club two for sure to mm. back you up um you talked earlier about being on the on the bench and having to back up some of the top top um goalkeepers of the time mentally and well let's just go mentally how how mentally would you um well first of all how was your experience on that to, to keep you going and secondly what would you do and say to that kid that young prospect that's also doesn't matter if they're a goalkeeper but they're in the same situation where they're having to constantly try to be out somebody that right now has probably got the confidence or the manager's confidence or whatever the case may be how did you because that's i think that would be a really good thing for some of these kids to to understand i think the way i've gone through and this is what i teach all my my, my clients is there's always something around the corner there's always a bigger picture so you know for example i'm on the bench um with uh, uh when i signed for wimbledon I'm on the bench, I'm not playing, and I could have had two options, just kind of slack off, don't work hard, you know, um, or I could keep going as if I am playing, and just when that call comes, you're ready. So um, I remember it was a, it was a, I think it was a uh, Saturday, no, it was a Sunday, we're training, and my coach says, uh, Ian, I want to go, I want to get you some games, I want to put you on loan. Uh, can you play? And I was like, sure. When are we playing? He goes tomorrow night at Tottenham live on TV. So I go to Derby County on loan. The following day, I'm playing for Derby County live on TV. Don't even know half the players' names. No disrespect, but just you know. Um, and at, at Tottenham, and I went in. I played an amazing game. Um, you know, we we lost, but I had a really good game. And you know, so there's your example of just always be ready. Always keep working as if you are starting because when you do get that moment, you got to be ready because you don't you don't get many chances. Um, but it's just to me, it's the only option. I mean, the, the other option is you just you, you know you're not going to go anywhere. So um, things change quickly in football, in soccer, and um, you know you just you just mentally get your head down and you, you always realize your bigger picture and it's just you know it's a t it's a moment in time. So you just got to think, all right, it might might not be starting right now, but when I do, I want to. You know, I want to keep it going. Well, that's a, that's a good story right there for people to hear. 24 hours later, going from a training session ground to first team football, soccer, sorry. Um, having playing against for like, the club in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, good. So we'll come back a little bit to the 2000s when you came back to the Premier League. But let's let's move on to um, the U.S. national squad and, and how that came about. You're in England at the time, I believe, um, playing. And you got a phone call. Uh, how did that go down? Um, well, okay, so my first actual with the U.S. national team. Mm -hmm. are we talking? Okay, my first uh, time with the national team was with uh, I think I was with Molenbeek at the time. Uh, we played against Spain. We went to Spain and then we went to Morocco. Um, so that was my first spell. That was um, the first game was against Morocco, wasn't it? In night night first time. That was with um, um, Luke. What was the coach's name again? Luke Lukowski. Um, uh, oh man, I'm blanking right now. 
I can't remember, yeah. Um, but my second one was with Steve Sampson um, when I was getting that call. So that's more when I was with the Luton, uh, Luton Town and all that. Um, God, just what an honor, you know? I mean, that's just the biggest honor to play for your country, um, you know, and, and to be just part of that era. I mean, we had some great players. Unfortunately for me, I kind of was in a an era where we had like two amazing goalkeepers in front of me, Keller and Friedel. So I really never had the, I could never really complain and knock on the coach's door and say, look, you got to play me. You know, I couldn't, I just had to be part of it. Um, I held my own. I felt like in training, Hey, I was just as good, if not better on some things, but they were there, they, they, you know, and just talk about two amazing goalkeepers, you know, just, and, and just great guys as well. You know, I played with Friedel in the Olympics uh, in 92 in Barcelona. Um, and I know Keller from the English scene, you know, playing against, I played against him maybe four or five times. So they're both amazing uh, goalkeepers and just legends, you know, just legends. Yeah, they, they play for some, yeah, they, they, they certainly had a career as well to, to be proud of. So you did get to get on the field against Morocco. So I think it was Morocco, right? I'm saying yeah. that right? Uh, okay, yeah. so so let's, let's as an individual point of view, you, you're coming on, you're representing your country. What's going through your mind? What, what's, what are you feeling as you're representing your country? You're playing at the highest level you can play at. Let's be honest. There's only 11 decisions at that point or a squad of 18 or 24, whatever it is, but you're, you're on the field. So you've got to be one of the top players of your country of that time. Yeah. What, what, was, what was the feelings like? Let people know what it feels like to play for your country at the highest level. It, you know, you just go back to all of the extra work that you did as a kid, going from what we talked about when I was in Vegas with the ball machine going out in the heat and just going for four or five hours straight to the wall work that I did. Uh, to all the individual coaching that, you know, guided me to my parent, all the things that, that, that brought you to that moment, you know, and when you do put on the shirt and you see that badge, you just, I mean, like you said, that's just, you're just such in an elite group now and you're representing the whole country, you know, not just a team and, and, and there's just no better feeling. Um, it's awe-inspiring. I mean, it's, it's nerve wracking as well. Um, but to have to have done that it was was again just another dream come true, and to me there's really no no bigger honor than that. You know, you know, I've I've always asked players, um, you know, that I've coached or I, I know when you go onto that field and you've played the highest level, obviously the time goes. Does it go well? I'll, let me ask you this: I've had both. Does it go real quick? Does it go real slow? Um, and how does that? Do you try and soak it all in, or are you so worried about making sure you do everything correctly that your 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 senses and everything else within that game is, man, I've got to do everything right, and you you don't enjoy. I, I don't know if that's the right word to use, Ian, but you know, I think you know what I'm trying to get at, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I think the more games you play, the better. That 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 becomes the, the my first game against Morocco. It was like a blur. Uh, you know, like I said, I was trying to do everything right. You know, just just getting get in you know with some of the teammates and all the coach and all that so um it was a blur but the more times you go it becomes a little bit more you can enjoy it and uh um kind of take a little bit of a of a breath you know absolutely well yeah not, not many people have had that experience Ian. so i think um tremendous job on on getting to that level as well um okay. certainly a, a story for for the rest of your life there. So you yeah. then went back to Major, Major League Soccer, acquired you at that point to, to the New England Revolution. Was, mm -hmm. was Steve at Revolution at that point coaching? Who was coaching the Revolution then? Steve, no, it was uh, uh, Thomas Wrong. Okay. So you, were you there for about a year? I was there for a year. So how did you feel the the coming from the, Nash, uh, the, the Premier League, the Premiership, the English Championship. How did you feel at this moment in time for Major League Soccer? We're, what we're talking, 98, four years yeah. after the World Cup, very infancy of, of, of the league. Um, how did you feel it was doing at that point when you, when you jumped in the league? It was good. Um, yeah, it was good. It was, it was on its way to what it is becoming now. Um, it was a little tougher. Um, because I was used to playing around, you know, certain caliber of players, not to disrespect the players at all. It's just, there is a difference between Europe and, you know, Premier League and, and MLS. So it was, it was, you know, and I felt sometimes, um, 
I, I found it personally a little bit tough um, because I found myself trying to um, cover or compensate for, for other players not being in a good position or, you know, so it got myself in an awkward situation, you know, like when I'm playing at West Ham, I got Rio Ferdinand, Igor Stimach, you know, all these guys that, you know, just aren't, they're in good positions. Your decision's pretty easy. Um, and um, it, it was, it was fun, but it was, it was difficult. It was difficult. So, yeah. so, and I, and listen, I, we're not disrespecting the American game. I'm, I'm now here and no. I want to make the Americans not as good as I can make them. Right. Yeah. So, but do you feel that maybe one of the things that we're still, and again, you, you're in the game now, you're still in the game. You're doing the, the goalkeepers with your academy and you're, you're, you're still engaged. Do you still feel that maybe what you were talking about there was decision-making and understanding roles and responsibilities? Do we, do you feel that maybe the emphasis is still on the skills and the technical side, as opposed to what you probably got in the English game, which was more about how the game's played, the tactical side of the game, roles, responsibilities of the game, decision-making I know is key over there. I mean, that was drummed into me left, right, and center. Is there, are those probably the, the differences that you're seeing? I mean, you don't have to agree with that. You can only give me what you, you think yourself. For sure. I mean, it, like I said, just to, over there, you grow up with the game, you see it, you live it, you're immersed in it. You don't even have a choice. If you, Even if you want to leave it, you don't have a choice. You're still listening to it and immersed in it if you're over there. Um, and I think that's just that little, um, whoever has seen the movie Spinal Tap, it's just, it's turning it to level 11. Okay. It's just that next little bit that you need. Um, and when you have that, I, I think, you know, it's just it's it's just a, just a little bit of finishing touch on your game, and I think we're we're getting there in this country, in terms of the 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 tactical and the you know the decision making side. We're very technical, yeah. Technically, we're you know got some good players, but I think the next level is going to be knowing the game and reading the game during the game because it is a player's game. You know, we don't have coach. You know, coach can't be sitting there telling you exactly everything to do every second. So, you know. The, the, the tactics and during the game and have players understanding how to make the game work within what's happening during the game is, is, is key. And I think that's the next level for American soccer. Cause we're all good. If we have a system, you know, we're playing a four, four, two, we're doing this, we're doing, and then once that system isn't working, can you then fix it on the field without having someone tell you that's the key, you know? And I think over there, that's, that's something that they have just because from day one, they're immersed in it. You know, when I think we talked before we went live here in about the lockdown and, um, you know, I think one of the, the missing points of the game is, is the young player jumping into the backyard and just, I mean, you mentioned it to me. I say it all the time to my, my players. Hey, when I was growing up, I walked down from school, kicked the ball against the wall and I'd done it until my grandma shouted for me to come in. You were saying, you said it without me talking to you about it. You said exactly the same thing. You were working out in the backyard. Maybe that's part and parcel also of, of Hopefully, we'd see in this lockdown more elevation in the individual training, but I'm not so sure. I think we still look up for that coachability, and maybe that's what's holding us back in America. I, again, I, I think you nailed it. And one of the things over there, you you would dribble your soccer ball to school. You would you would go to the park every day. And I think to here sometimes it's too structured. We need a balance of both. For example, I used to coach my uh, I coached my daughter's team for a little bit, and if we we would train twice a week. OK, um, every third session. So we would have technical sessions, obviously, you know, I got to teach them the game. And, but every third session, I would put two small goals up. And I'd say play. That was it for two hours. So I forced them to just play. And there was no coach telling them what to do. I said, the only rule is you got to play. You can't be sitting here picking daisies and like, you know, whatever. But you got to play. Just try to play. And then just, you know, so you can try things out. You can not have a coach yelling at you and in, in fear of that. So I think it's so important to have the balance. And that's where you have, you know, kids in Argentina, Brazil, England, they're growing up on the streets playing with no structure. They can be free. They can try new things out. That's actually where they build a lot of their skill. Okay. Then you can go into a structured environment and learn the tactics and the, and the you know, the, the functional and the, all those sides. So I think it's important. We have to have a balance. And I think sometimes, we have just such a structured um, environment where every kid's being told exactly what to do all the time, blah, blah, blah. So all of a sudden you put them in the driver's seat and, and they don't have a clue, you know? 
yeah, I, I completely agree with everything you got there, and, and you know, obviously I look into myself, and I'm part and parcel of that that problem and that and that issue, right? So, um, so some really good stuff there. So let's let's go to um, Galaxy. You're uh, the coach for the, the the Galaxy, and it coincides with one of the major players, I think, that came from the the world soccer, um, and really, again, is, is it proven? I think there's been many documentaries about the the effect, but um, you got to, you got to work obviously I'm guessing with David Beckham yeah. um, and his free kicks and everything else that would be against the goalkeepers that you're training. How did you feel first of all before we go into training or anything? How did you feel that effect changed? You were in the Major League Soccer at the time when that when he came in. How did you feel that changed um, the game over here? He, he to be honest, regardless what anyone says, he literally was the best thing that's ever happened in MLS soccer. Okay, period. Besides the league forming, what that guy did for the league was immeasurable. People that aren't behind the scenes will never know this, but from the signing of kids autographs everywhere he went, I mean, this guy literally was the nicest, most genuine guy of, of his stature I've ever met. I mean, the guy is obviously world world renowned, but worked hard in training, gave everything. You couldn't get him off the field. I mean, there'd be times he'd be, be you know, having an ankle injury, um, limping around, and, you know, Bruce Arena, our coach, would be, you know, hey, you know, how you doing? He's like, no, nope, I'm good, I'm good, you know. And he just, you couldn't get him off the field. He just loves soccer. So um, he has done, like I said, just, he's just done, he did amazing things for for, for MLS. And it just, it, it, I think it just spurred on other players to come here. Number one, it got fans into the seats. I remember we would play in New York, and uh, if he was playing, I mean, we would have 60,000 people there. You know, we'd have to move it to Giant Stadium. And there was times where we'd have to move stadiums just because the, the demand was so big. So uh, nothing but, but amazing things to say about that guy. And, you know, I, I played against him a couple times when I was in England, so we kind of knew each other, you know, via via. But then when, he, when you know, he came to Galaxy – um, we hit it off really well, and again, just great guy. So, do you think that when just for LA Galaxy now, in, in, away from the MLS, do you think it improved the the structure? I won't say structure; that's a, definitely a bad word. Um, did it improve the work ethic? Did it improve the quality or the standards? Let's say standards that were expected within the club, just with him coming through the door. Oh, 100 percent. The moment he came through the door, everything just raised a notch from um, how we trained to the discipline, to um, our expectations, you know, I mean, everything changed and, and he had a hand in a lot of it. And he, um, he set the club off to some great things and it took a couple seasons and he got flack for it. And I think mo most of the flack he got for it was just people that don't understand what his role was. I mean, oh, David Beckham, famous soccer player, he's gonna score a goal. No, he's not gonna score goals. He's gonna score some, but he's not your, he's not your, yeah, he's, he's going to guy that's going to pass to the guy that scores goals. So, um, you know, they were looking for this guy to be the top league goal scorer every year. And I'm like, that's not his role. He's an assist. You know, he's a free kick taker. He's going to score some goals, obviously, but he's more of a team player. So um, once people started realizing that and then once we won two two championships with him, um, yeah, it kind of it kind of put people in place a little bit. So, I mean, he came from Real Madrid at that point, and I don't remember or recall anybody coming from such a big club, and he was still in his late 20s. He wasn't even in his 30s yet when he came to the States. Yeah. Um, so with a player of that stature, playing Champions League, um, winning the, the the trophies that he did in Real Madrid, was there any type of, oh, my gosh, we got Beckham playing for us now, and it stifled it? Did it stifle anything at first? It probably stifled a few things at first, I think, because the first year he was there, we had a couple rough seasons. Um, the first and second year he was there, it was it was rough. And it, whether it was it was that or just whether this is what my personal feeling was, there were some players that didn't know what he was capable of doing. So he would whip a ball in, and as a goalkeeper, I'm sitting there um, as a coach on the bench, going, "Man, that's a great ball. We need to get on the end of that." And certain people would be like. Why did he cross that? You know, no, he crossed it. You need to get there. So he puts it into danger. So it took a little bit of time for us to kind of evolve to what he's capable of doing. And once we did, 
I mean, it was, it was, it was magical. And, you know, obviously then we, you know, we, we, we got Landon Donovan, Robbie Keane, and, and those guys know where to be. So, you know, we, we became a pretty good force, you know. Yeah. Robbie Keane was a, was a, was a tremendous signing to make sure he can get him and, and Beckham, but we did Beckham get, again, we're not talking for him, but in your opinion, was he frustrated in any shape or form with, with some of the, maybe the standards that he was used to and then coming into a specifically like you said, the first couple of years, the standards that he was getting, um, was there frustration in there? Did that spill over? Uh, On his part, was there frustration? Is that what you're Frustration with maybe the, the play and the players that are around him at the particular time. Again, we're not naming names or trying to put, we're just trying to give an opinion. That I mean, how do we feel back in frustration if he's putting all these balls in and he's doing all the work and then not getting rewarded for it in terms of not him being rewarded, but rewarding for the team because we haven't got players in the right areas? Did he get frustrated with that frustration? Um, no, I don't think he got frustrated. He, he again, he could have because he's David Beckham and, and, you know, he can demand what he wants. But actually what he did was he actually started getting together with some of the players that weren't, let's say, on the same page. And he goes, look, when I'm over here doing it, you know, when I'm doing this, do this. When I'm doing I'm going to put it in here. You got to be, you know, so he actually was was a very good, you know, team leader. Um, he like I said, he demanded a lot from everybody, but uh, he, he never really you know, showed any signs of uh, not wanting to be there or, or frustrated or whatever. He was just, again, all around, just just good pro, you know. Well, he's been, in my opinion, um, being in Dallas and living in Dallas, um, he used to come to Dallas a few times. I know that when we had games over here, it was um, just like you said in New York. It was an absolute sellout. You had to purchase your ticket before the, the season started. And then, of course, injuries, when he, he got a couple of injuries and missed out a few of the games. But in my opinion, he's done um, absolute wonders and probably put the MLS to to speed it up a little bit to where it's got to right now. So good job for him, and and what a what a way to get to work with such a top guy as well. Um, I, I've got about ten more minutes. Are you cool with that? I know we were trying to keep about an hour, but you're so interesting. Um, I was going to try and get a little bit more in before we we shut it off, if you don't mind. I got so time. so cool. So um, you've been at Galaxy. Is there any any memorable moment of your time at Galaxy? that you'd like to share with us just anything that just peaks in your mind that when you're at galaxy as that co as that coach and coaching there's some great players there when you were there as well um was there anything that pops I mean, out for you just some of the relationships i built with my keepers and some of the players um i was there nine seasons we won two championships um winning that first one was amazing i mean just there's no words lifting the trophy um it, it, you know, it was just such a great time for the club. You know, we had great players, great organization, the backroom staff to this day I'm friends with. Um, and uh, funny, one of the funny memories, not funny, but one of the best memories was um, th throughout the years, I, I obviously was there for a while and, you know, we came to know everybody and, and there was one game we played. It was a late night kickoff. It was like a midweek game and we had training the following day. So uh, I brought my son to the game and after the game i uh i i slept in the stadium with my son in in uh so we had the in the locker room there was like some couches and we stayed the night there so we had like a little sleepover but what was really cool was um when everybody left and everybody my son and i we went on the pitch and we just kicked around um you know reenacted goals you know, he would go on goal. I would go on goal. He would kick to me. I'd kick to him. You know, so we, you know, we stayed the night there and had like a little sleepover at the stadium. And that was one of the the coolest moments for me. Um, for him at that age, I think he might have been about eight or nine at the time to to experience that and see it and then just feel special like that, like he can get on the field. And I think, again, those are those moments that catapult you to pursue your dream maybe even more, you know. And uh, it, it was a special, it was a special moment. That was fun. And so that's that's a cool story. So so what about in your in your soccer career? Is there a highlight in your soccer career that you that just you just relive all the time? My debuts, my debut for West Ham, uh, walking out at Upton Park, and uh, just hearing the the, the forever blowing bubbles. Uh, my debut at home at Luton Town was special um and then you know the national team and and the other one was the olympics you know 
we uh, we played in the uh, the '92 Olympics at Barcelona. We went. Uh, our first game was against Italy. Um, and even though I didn't play, Brad Friedel started. Um, you know, walking out, and we line up, and then they play the national anthem, and it's at the New Camp Stadium. There's 75,000 people there, um, and they're playing the national anthem. And I was I was I was holding back some tears. I mean, that was just probably that was a special moment. You know, that was really special, you know. So, yeah, you know. Well, you've certainly had, um, you've had a lot of people's dreams and you've lived it. So that's that's absolutely phenomenal. Now, talking about dreams, there's some other people that have dreams of doing other things, which you may have been, you may have inadvertently already done. So you got to tell me, um, acting, even, oh. it is a big, even it is in a big suit. My acting so, career. Yeah. Your okay. acting career. <laughs> So, you know, Vinnie Jones, so at Wimbledon, when you were at Wimbledon, was Jonesy at Wimbledon at the time? I think, he, no, he's not. But yeah, he, he was he was gone. Yeah. He, okay, I was, I was going to say, you're following in footsteps or maybe Beckham's footsteps with doing uh, whichever, yeah. which you did bend it like Beckham or whatever. But um, yeah. so you did, I'm not going to spoil it, but you did a, just two, right? Or did you do more than two? I just did the one. I did one. The one, but you were involved in another one, right? Oh, I was involved with, yeah, okay. I was involved in yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so why don't you... Why don't you tell us the famous one first, and then um, we'll go to the other one. Okay, well, both were, I guess, so the the kicking and that one first, or the other one? Let's do the kicking and screaming. That was the earlier one, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, kicking and screaming. Um, one of my buddies, Dan, he, Dan Metcalf, he, 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 um, he was involved in the, uh, the, he was asked to do all the soccer coordination uh, for kicking and screaming. So he invited me on to be his assistant, and um, so we were on the set pretty much every day. And there was a few times where um, they got me involved. Like one of the scenes is where Pele kicks the ball into the stand. There's a goalkeeper. That's me. It's at the Home Depot Center uh, the car in Carson, the Galaxy Stadium, whatever it's called now. They've changed the name so many times. Um, so we did that. So I was in it a, a couple times, but more on yeah, the side Pele, of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, Pe yeah, it wasn't Pele, but yeah. The, the funny story is we had this guy who, come in especially for this scene and it's like a five second scene it's just someone kicking a ball into um into the stands and i'm in goal and uh so he has to kind of look like Pele because they want to do a close-up so we we get to, to the galaxy stadium we got all these extras i mean we, we we brought in thousands of people to sit in the stand it was a major operation i mean it started at 6 p.m and we went through the night literally till about 4.30, maybe 5 in the morning. The whole opera, getting everybody dressed, you know, 70s gear, sideburns, everything. So we go to do the first take. And the guy takes one shot and pulls his hamstring. So now he can't shoot the ball. It's So it, it just literally was the longest night ever. It was funny in hindsight, but at the time we're going, oh, my God, what do we do? So that's a, a funny story from that movie. But most of what I did was on the on the the soccer side, on the on the the coordination side. Choreography and stuff. Yeah, the choreography, which we didn't have a lot of say in at the end. So some of it, my my buddy and I were looking at it, going, okay, we we had stuff that was better they didn't use, but unfortunately the the, the director and the editor kind of weren't big soccer fans, so they, they didn't give us good on camera, right? Yeah, they they didn't give us a lot of freedom to make it as realistic as we want, even though we did a pretty good job. Well, uh, oh, cool. then the other one. Um, yeah, let's move on to that one. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the other one was, I played the Predator in uh, Alien versus Predator. That so, was the Requiem? Requ Requiem, yeah. Uh -huh. Requiem, yeah. 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 So that was the second one. Um, so yeah, I just- How on again, earth did you get that job? It, it just, tr truly who you know and being six foot seven. Um, so, I coached, I coached the goalkeeper through my academy, and one of the players on his team, his dad is very high up in the movie business, and one day I met him at a, at a game that I was watching the goalkeeper that I train, and he just interested, introduced himself as Mike. We became, you know, just, that was it. I, I said, hey, Mike, what's up? And he, he, he just told me, you're doing a great job with our keeper. So about a year later, Mike calls me. I haven't heard from him since. Mike calls me, and he's like, hey, Ian, this is Mike, you know, the dad from the soccer team, whatever. And he goes, uh, have you seen the movie uh, uh, Predator with, with Arnold Schwarzenegger? And I was like, yeah, back in like, you know, the old, yeah. He goes, yeah. He goes, how would you like to play the Predator, Predator in the next one? And I just like, I was like, wait, who are you? 
who are you? How is it possible? Whatever. So he explained, he's like a senior producer, executive, all that. And he goes, look, he goes, try the suit, come tomorrow, try the suit on. If it fits, the role is yours, man. And so that was kind of it. Um, they're like, you know, he needed like a, um, a six foot seven athletic build guy that can roll around, do somersaults, do his own stunts and everything. So he's like, I got the guy. And he called me up and that was it. So it was about three weeks of shooting. And uh, that was it. So now you're an actor and a soccer player. Oh, yeah. I'm an actor. Yeah, everything. Everything. (laughs) Well, very, very cool. Well, I've got a couple of things that have been asked of us. Um, So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask the first one here. So um, the game has changed over the years for the goalkeeper. With the game changing, how would that have affected your career? That's a good question. Um, how would it have affected? I mean, I don't know if it would have because I would have just I would have adapted to it and worked on it. Um, it kind of did change while I was playing because my my first year of pro at seventeen, I think we could still roll the ball out and then get it back and pick it up. I can't remember. I know it changed around when I was fifteen or sixteen. So then all of a sudden you got to start playing back passes and it was just like overnight. So I remember that. So, you know, it took a little bit of time, but you know, you get used to it. I think you just adapt, adapt to everything that, that, that gets thrown at you. But I mean, obviously now players are, you know, goalkeepers are like field players now and, you know, they're playing higher off their line and all that, but that's, I feel it, you know, it's, it's not something that I couldn't have adapted to or didn't have to, you know what I mean? Okay, cool. So, um, you do camps now, and I, I want to go into that so you can um, you can talk a little bit more about your camps and what you do throughout the year and how people can get an opportunity to jump on your camps. So do you want to give a little bit of an overview of what you're doing right now with your with your camps? Yeah, your so goal, I, and your, goal, and your goalkeeper business, right? Yeah, yeah. So since I retired, uh, I started my own goalkeeping academy, Premier Goalkeeping Academy. Um, and it's just evolved into just an amazing um, – assembly line of just of, of, of helping these keepers and I've adapted again going back to the previous question I've even adapted my coaching style to adapt with the current needs as well and and um it's uh it's something that I take a lot of pride in and and um just just really proud of so what it basically is is during the week every you know I'm doing all my my private and semi-private sessions um and then I have about four to five camps per year and I'm trying to expand into different cities, but at the moment they're all in Southern California. And um, the tech, the, the the weekly private sessions, you know, um, supplement the camps. The camps are geared a little different. So the weekly sessions are geared technical. Uh, they're a lot more technical, and uh, um, the camps are very very functional. Um, they're very game related. In fact, you get to it's a four day camp, two hours a day. Um, you warm up on your own. Once I say we're starting, we go into it and we, we create, you know, um, each day we pick a topic and we create four or five, I have four or five goals set up and each one is a different scenario on that topic, maybe a different distance, maybe a different angle or whatever. And it's very, very game related scenarios. Um, and the, the success we've had with that has just been tremendous because the keepers usually don't get the game related scenarios they need during the week with their team to then be able to go into a game and have a, a you know a good feel of what to do so like i said you know example would be 1v1 day um we'll have five different 1v1 scenarios that i've created that happen very often um i'll have a defender coming in i'll have a forward coming in I'll have outlets for a, a, you know, a distribution, you know, so, so many things that are game related that never really get to get worked on. Um, so the camps are one of my, you know, favorite things to do every year. Um, Cause I just see from day one all day, just the knowledge that these kids get from these four day sessions. Um, it's incredible. You know? Um, well, I so. think you're doing an important job there really, because I, I, you know, however much coaches in the youth game, they've got their whole team. It's it. I feel um, you know, we, we do a real good job, I think, in our club, but I think there's also that disconnect sometimes in tr- how do we incorporate the goalkeeper all of the time and are they being missed out? I, I call it the forgotten player syndrome sometimes. So, I think one, one, we're, sorry, go ahead. 
So I think for, for anybody that's listening, this would be, if you can get to Southern California, maybe if you're interested, we can connect later and bring you to Dallas for uh, for something so we can have people. I mean, this is a mecca for soccer here as well, just like Southern California and Northern California. But oh, what were you sure. say? I rude interrupt you. Oh, no, no, you, I interrupt you. I'm sorry. Um, well, my wife's from Dallas, so I visit Dallas often, and I love Dallas. Um, so, in fact, one day I'm sure I'm going to be moving there, you know, at some point. But um, one of the other things that I do is I, I, I do a seminar actually just for the coaches um, where the club will get um, their whole coaching staff comes out. And I run about an hour, hour and a half session on four different topics, you know, shot stopping, 1v1s, crossing, distribution. Um, but it's geared towards getting your keeper within the team, how to do it. Because so many times, you know, the head coach is maybe the wrong words fearful, but it's like it's just an unknown. So it's like, okay, keeper, join us or go over there in the corner with the other keeper and kick and do it. So what I do is I try to explain to them, I understand it's a foreign subject. So here I am. I'm going to help you get through to where it's not foreign and just understanding the basics. And it's not even so much the technical side. The technical side kind of sorts itself out with the keeper coach. You know, you can leave that to the keeper coach. So I feel as a head coach, you don't necessarily have to know how to correct your keeper technically. I think what you have to do is understand their decisions, when to come out, when not to come out. This cross, maybe you should have come out. But if you under, if you explain to them why a keeper did or didn't come out and what to look for, I think that's the key. And then the other side is how do you incorporate that into a training session where you're not disregarding your team now because you're working with the keeper. So how do you get them both involved? So I love doing those sessions as well. So I show them how to get both keeper and team involved on a topic that literally you could say this session is, is for the midfielders, but it's actually designed for the goalkeeper. So everybody on your team is going to think it's designed for them, but in actuality, you're working with your goalkeeper. Okay, so I think those sessions are super important. And I think that that goalkeeping knowledge of, you know, incorporating your goalkeeper into the team training is is, is invaluable, you know. So yeah, I love playing it. Really. And I think I think too much has been, not too much, there's a lot of emphasis upon connection between the lines on the outfield. And they forget about the connection and communication between the goalkeeper and the, the first line of your entire your yeah. entire field. So so yeah. some great stuff. And what we'll do, Ian, if you don't mind, we're going to connect your website and your camp dates and stuff. We're going to connect it with this webinar so that when people do watch it on demand, that they can they can also look for that information if you don't mind. It's just ianfoyer.com. It'll go straight to the, yeah, ianfoyer.com. So my, I've got another one question coming in here. Um, mm -hmm. Usually it's, it's the question is, uh, where do you see yourself in five years? But you've done so much and, you know, you've already lived a, a life within a life. What is there? Is there anything out there that you still have a um, you want to achieve? You, you have a, a goal of achieving um, in your life? There's two things. One is being a goalkeeper coach um, overseas at a big club. I feel I've, I've I've done enough hours of literally every single um, type of goalkeeper. Good it comes in amazing maybe a little arrogant, I got to tone it down a little bit. Uh, a young keeper, um, a keeper that's been cut, a keeper that has zero confidence, a keeper that has a parent that's a helicopter, you know, mom or dad, all these different scenarios, all the way through to pros. I've coached, you know, Galaxy for a while. I coached Tim Howard in a couple camps with the national team, Hope's fellow. So I've had kind of every level of, you know, this pyramid of development. And I feel like I could do a solid job as a goalkeeper coach in a big team in Europe. Um, and then on this side, I would love to one day become a head coach of, uh, of a team, um, you know, first over here. I feel I'm not ready yet, though. Uh, when I do go into a head coaching role, um, you know, it depends where. I feel I'm ready for a lot of maybe head coaches roles here. But the one I want is, it's, you know, I'm not ready yet. I still want to learn a lot more and, and learn the side of the game uh, of that side. But you know, a head coach on a, on, on a team over here or, or a keeper coach over overseas would be probably, you know, something I would I would entertain. That would, that would complete it. And, I was, you know, I was going to ask you a little bit earlier when we were talking about the, the English clubs. You did go to Wales as well, Cardiff. We didn't mention yep. about Cardiff too much, but um, I'll be I'll be going to Cardiff actually at the end of this year. I'm going to go there to, to look at a few things. But um, would you see yourself going back to the UK? But you've already kind of answered that, that you would like to go back in a capacity of a, of a goalkeeper coach or, or maybe 
you know, coaching other aspects, but or even assistant coaching. coach. I mean, I feel like you know, a um, couple of my old teams, you know, possibly a, a, an assistant coach role to start off with, or you know, goalkeeper to keeper coach and move my way up. But um, yeah, I have aspects of that. Well, cool. Well, listen, I've absolutely taken far too much of your time, but one thing I will say in all this lockdown, I've been able to, to connect and reconnect with a lot of a lot of friends and a lot of good people in the game. And this has been one of the most enjoyable um, connections that um, we've done for a webinar. Ian, I hope it's been interesting for you as well. And we've not done the same typical questions that you would normally be asked. I'm sure we hit a couple of those, um, but I hope you enjoyed it as well. It's and, been you know, great. If we if you want to connect and uh, we can make one of those Dallas weekends or weeks work out, we can probably do that for you as well. That would certainly be something I think we can make work over here. I would love that. So once again, Ian, thank you so much. What a great webinar. Um, and we really appreciate all the time you've given up. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. And we're done. Well, man, done. I'm, I'm telling you, that was fantastic. I, I absolutely awesome had a great time doing that. I hope, again, I'm, I'm always nervous about people that do a lot of um, of work anyway with, with some of the media about asking the same boring questions all the time. No, so I'm hoping, yeah, okay, I'm hoping I change it up a little bit. And I'm uh, serious yeah. about the Dallas, you know, I run, I'm not sure how much you know about us and what we do, but, um, you know, obviously I'm from the UK as well, but I came yeah, over yeah. 20 years ago. And uh, as you can see here, Colonel Storm, Colonel Cornish, so I'm from Cornwall. Yeah, but, um, Cornwall. We uh, we've got a pretty big club now, and we've we've won a couple of national championships, and it's only it's only been 15 years or so now, but yeah. um, we already bring Partick Thistle in. So a lot of my friends, so I already did a webinar with with Ian Birchnell. He's new, he's over in Sweden doing Ostersunds. He worked uh -huh. for me 15, 20 years ago now. So we brought him on, and I got Scotty Allison. But I bring them over to Dallas, and they stay with me, and they um, I bring in kids that want to be able to coach. So if you really yeah. want to do um, and, and maybe have a footprint in Dallas, at least to try it. We're open to, to, to communicate and see what that would look I like for you. Because the only reason stopping me from other cities is just, I need I need someone in that city mm -hmm. to kind of help me sit like, okay, what field, who me, you know, keepers, kind of, so I need someone to really, you know, so, and if I do it, I do want to do it right. So someone like yourself, yeah, I'd love to, to, to see and what we, we can. We don't have to do it our fields, although we've built, our fields it's not the top top end that you could probably get that you're used to in the professional game but we can even rent out some of those fields in more of the metroplex i'm about 20 minutes south of dallas in Waxahachie, but um yeah, we can out. certainly get something up and around carrollton dallas irving that kind of area that need, would get a bigger area you know if we were going to do a camp all i would need is 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 a, is a, a nice just a decent pitch and um you know, it depends if how I got there. If I, you know, I'd have my own gear. If I drove there, if not, you know, but we could sort that out. I don't need a I'd lot. Sort gear. I can sort you somewhere to stay. I can sort your fields. We we can take care of you. We and I can. What I'll do is, if there's something you wanted to do, when we're all in lockdown, then when we know a date, I can advertise for you because I'm already connected with even from Oklahoma and Tulsa. Our leagues play from Kansas City down. So even when I'm doing my own college, we do a college combine as well. We get kids from Houston from. Tulsa, from Oklahoma City, from Bentonville. Yeah. So we can yeah. certainly, with 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 what you're doing and, and what you're doing with your academy, I'm I'm pretty sure if you capped it out, whatever number you capped it out in, I, I bet you would end up filling it out pretty quick. We just need time. That was the thing. The key thing. Yeah, yeah. I think the only thing I need from you is is the the again, if I don't drive there, the equipment side. But what I what I kind of gear is is there's five goals that I set up. Okay. Um, and in each goal, you have maybe maximum 10 keepers. Okay. So usually it's between eight and 10. Um, and each goal has a coach that okay. wouldn't necessarily need to, um, yeah. So that, that would be the hard part. It would, it would be, I would have to have like, you know, four or five coaches that, well, that kind of, we, we have some know? goalkeeper coaches in the club. So that, yeah. I don't, so I don't, I don't think that would be an issue. What they're looking for. Yeah. You know, you, I mean, I'm not a goalkeeper coach, but I've done yeah. goalkeeper licensing. But you can tell me what to do. I can be one of them. But we can. So I think I can make all of that happen for you, and I can get the, the the players in. So if we want to keep the communication going and and see really what what kind of the money you're looking at, and I mean, um, we can make all of that work out and then charge for the camp, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so we cover all the bases, and then you should be good to go. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, man. Yeah. I I definitely have taken up more of your time than than no uh, I should be, but. Yeah. 
Hey, I really appreciate it, Ian. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll connect again. Yeah, anytime, buddy. Just, I'm always here. Thanks, man. Hello. All right, well, enjoy the rest of the time. Let's hope we can get back to what we do best pretty soon. All right, All right buddy. All right. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.